We set up the infrastructure, we turned our extensions, we integrated with the rest of the infrastructure, users, our devices are connecting, and other stuff starts. We are opening new offices. Where is the golden config? We're going to apply that to the switch that we're shipping there. Oh, we installed this thing, but now I realize that I need to call 1-800-SWITCH for this product support and 1-800-WLAN for this product support. Who's going to project manage our IT support tickets? Who's going to manage the software updates? Are we doing Friday afternoons? Are we doing Sunday mornings? What are we going to do? Who's going to project manage that? Oh, by the way, X product vendor has a patch release for this AP and then another patch release for the switch because we run into that bug. And then when we upgraded to the previous one, the release note said, we're not going to run into that issue, but we still run into it. Are we going to manage that? That entire software management can be a lot of pain. Everything is running fine. And somebody says the business is expanding. We need more employees coming in. Capacity needs to increase. We need to divide this big open room into three rooms. APs relocations need to change. Hardware refresh is going to happen. Hey, this product is end of life, end of sale. Who's going to project manage the replacement of that? We can script our way out of some of these things, and sometimes it's just not possible. But the entire cycle repeats on a daily basis for many organizations. So we said, how much of this time sync we can automate away? And uh, we come up with four ideas. We would love to share them with you. And the first one is related to that wireless, potentially wireless issue that I mentioned. So we're going to start there, and then we're going to keep going. Dipin. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Dipin Varde, and I'm part of the product management team here at uh, Nile. We call ourselves service owners, and I lead the wireless service. And uh, you folks have all heard a lot about building a deterministic system and closed loop automation and so on and so forth. So what I'm going to be talking about today is how we had to rethink at every level when we have to offer something as a service. And one of the areas that I've picked today for us is uh, RF channel planning. So let's take a step back and think about how RF channel planning is approached today. RF channel planning is not new. Algorithms have become advanced, they've become more sophisticated, and they continue to evolve. However, they still happen to be in a silo. Why do I say that? Because they lack maybe what happened during site survey, what data was collected during site survey. Is there anything site specific that I need to communicate to the channel planner? What about the end device perspective? Am I only considering AP to AP visibility? So those type of things is where we had to bridge those gaps because now we are offering a service which is guarantees packed. So we kind of have to cover the 360 degrees. So we had to go back and rethink, how do we do channel planning in the context of offering it as a service when it comes to wireless? So it all starts with the closed loop activation. We all made sure the foundation is strong, right? All the deviations are weeded out right at the time of install, meaning an AP that was supposed to go on floor one at X, Y, blah, blah, is on that X, Y, right? Once that happens, you have this rich survey data. What was the AP height for a given location? Was it a warehouse? Was it an enterprise space? Do I need to do things differently? So all of that data is captured and it's fed to our channel planner. What was the power level used during site survey? Because I may use the conducted power of 14 in some cases. In some cases, it might be 17. I went through all the pain to just do all of that survey. How about I actually feed that? to my channel planner to create that strong foundation so that the automation can run on top of it, right? So once the, once the Nile network is deployed, the digital twin is created, the sensors and the access points are going to start streaming rich telemetry data. And that telemetry data contains everything from channel load, which has all the components such as RXTX utilization from the AP's radio itself, overlapping BSS IDs, maybe external BSS IDs, APs in the neighborhood, uh, how is the sensor viewing uh, the APs in its neighborhood and so on and so forth. So this digital twin, not only for the Nile elements that we create, but the digital twin for the environment that we created is getting hydrated with this rich telemetry that we are sending. Again, to repeat, 
not just from the APs, but also from the sensors, because now you're kind of completing that loop and getting the end device perspective as well. Now let's assume that something changed in the RF environment. Something, something happened, like someone just pulled some metallic boards in a conference room or in a section of the open area in, a, in an office because they just wanted to do like a huddle and people just you know, pull all sorts of things and it caused an RF environment change. All of this data that is being streamed to the cloud is going to help us figure that out. The cognitive decision is going to detect that, hey, my digital twin of that environment looks different from what it was. And so it's going to then take some decisions. What's the most common decision? It may decide to say, I think I need to bump up power on APs X, Y, Z. Okay, great. But what's more important is, while you do that, you also want to make sure that you inform the right people that it's not just bumping up the power that's, that's sufficient, your Wi-Fi environment has changed. And so we are calling this continuous site survey. We are not calling this channel planning because channel planning would stop at, hey, I figured out the right channels and the power for the APs. However, how about if I'm able to tell you as a Nile service customer that your Wi-Fi environment has changed? And so next, we're going to jump into a quick demo. So before I jump into the specifics, this is probably the first time you're seeing the Nile operator portal. This is where the digital twin and the digital twin of the environment can be visualized. And what you're looking at is that ticket, the incident ticket that was generated by our uh, closed loop operation, closed loop automation. What it detected here was uh, the problem in the RF environment that I just talked about. Before we jump into that though, as you can see, we have the digital twin that you can visualize here, essentially the topology view of how the network is deployed. And for every Nile element, there is, there is a rich set of data available. You can check the device's state and health, device logs, device events, while I'm saying this, what I'm also trying to say is that gone are the days where customers have to worry about opening a support case because they ran into a problem. And the way that support call typically goes is, can you send me these logs? Can you send me a state dump? Can you send me a tar file of these events? Uh, oh, I may have lost the state because the event has already passed and so on and so forth. So all of that is something that Nile is now taking care of. Now coming to the cognitive decisions, this ticket that got auto-generated because it detected a change in coverage was analyzed by our cognitive decisions and it also generated a decision graph based on uh, the runbook that it was, uh, it was fed or trained on. And what it did was, it basically went and figured out, hey, I see a coverage problem and as you can see, the reporter was a sensor in this case. It wasn't an incident that was generated by an access point. And our automated RCA also detected that it's Wi-Fi environment because it detected low RSSI neighbors. And it did check for several other things. Hey, these were known RF neighbors. They were all found to be active. So basically, none of the APs have gone down. The sensor has been active up and running. And those known RF neighbors, which were okay until certain point in time, now suddenly are reporting low RSSI. This is something that's not possible when you're only looking at AP to AP visibility, because changes may not be happening at the AP's altitude. A changes may be happening at your device altitude, right? By extension of that, not just sensor, but now the possibilities are just multiples of this, right? I can start looking at end device data, and I can start looking at end device patterns to be able to detect such kind of wireless uh, environment changes. And as you can see here, it's a minor detail that may not um, be very visible, but the CAC ticket is essentially a customer support ticket that we generate, and that's essentially a work order to get in touch with the customer to say, hey, it's not just some AP going down and we mitigating a coverage hole, but it's actually an environment change. And we most likely have to get on a call with you and investigate, hey, have you moved things around a lot? 
do you need another site survey because hey we want to make sure that we provide you a guaranteed service right and that can only happen by closing the loop on bringing the determinism back into the system right so what happens like you know i used to work in the hotel industry and a big part important part is like a conference center a conference room say i have one of these plugged into the wall and someone goes and plugs it because they want that outlet. What is that going to do? Like, is that going to generate a bunch of, you know, misinformation? Or is that going to start making changes to the environment, even though it's just the sensor that got unplugged? So just like our access points, switches, NSB gateways, all of that stuff is monitored. The sensor also has a digital twin in the cloud. So when that sensor goes offline, we are not going to be panicking about, oh, my RSSI data changed and I didn't, didn't see any RSSI data from this sensor. No, we're going to say, hey, the sensor went offline. And that's going to fire off uh, a ticket to the customer, kind of the shared responsibility model a bit over here, where we say, hey, this sensor just went offline on us. So it's not impacting your service because the sensor is helping monitor your network. However, could you please go and check on that, plug the sensor back in, so you get uninterpreted monitoring. That's what would happen. So I did allude to uh, the digital twin of the environment. Again, we are talking about uh, basically, you know, the coverage heat map that, of course, is available in the cloud through the Nile operator portal. And if there are any uh, gray areas in here which signify a coverage hole, those would be visible. And just to give you an idea, I went through a lot of the data that we collect, right? I mean, I can, uh, I can basically, uh, you know, part of that is a lot of this RF data that we collect for every environment that we have in here. So I just wanted to kind of give a sneak peek into um, the neighbor tables that get generated from the AP's perspective, but also from the census perspective. And uh, just to jump back real quick and kind of give you a glimpse on uh, the query metric data. From the names, some of the things are quite intuitive, as you can see, there's like all of this deep instrumented data is being shipped to the cloud. Everything from what do my local intra NSB routes look like to the mem info, to CPU, memory, system info, fan, temperature, LLDP data, probes, radios, channels. It's just a ton of data because the digital twins are hungry and you need to keep them fed. All right, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ozer. Thanks, Sipin. I appreciate it. So, folks, you've seen the first demo of the autopilot software. In the first hour, we've shown you customer management portal, which was the deterministic way of kind of managing the installation design process, that closed loop activation process. Then the Nile operator portal is essentially production engineering team, customer success team, automatically tackling tickets that the network generates for itself. So when there's an issue in a wireless environment, you usually wait for the customer to call 1-800-WLAN, say, hey, you know, there's something going on with the wireless. Let's collect logs. Let's take a look at the AP, run this command, get this switch. And then that goes to tier one, tier two, tier three support. You start troubleshooting and you figure out that there's a coverage issue and then you start figuring out what the resolution should be. That entire manual process could take anywhere from three hours to three weeks. We have shrunk that into three minutes. That ticket that you just saw, that page, the decision graph, and the ticket creation with the CSEs, and the resolution, and the elimination of potential problems because of that decision graph, all automated. So the customers actually never create, well, we actually don't want them to create tickets for us. That's one of our goals, where we create any possible ticket in an environment ourselves, and then we come up with the resolution. And the next time the customer call us, kind of sort of know what to do or we, if we don't call them in advance. But that closed loop, kind of a, hopefully a breath of fresh air for many 
for the viewers out there and many of the delegates. So we're going to keep doing this with a second demo. This time we're going to look at the wired infrastructure after the wireless infrastructure. So with that, I'm going to invite Karthik. My name is Karthik. Uh, Karthik A. Nathalwar, and I'm responsible, uh, I'm one of the service owners responsible for the SaaS and data infrastructure side of things. And um, my responsibility is to provide the data infrastructure, A and ML algorithms on top of which all these beautiful applications are built. So today, I'm going to be talking about two specific use cases, just continuing with what uh, Dipain said. Um, the first use case is about the closed loop automation on the link errors. So here, um, we're going to talk about how the network behavior changes automatically based on, or, or network behavior changes to work around the link errors that are encountered. Okay? And in continuation of all the themes, so we, after the successful installation, the digital twin gets created. So that's our, always the starting point for us. And the smart agents, they continuously collect the data and they hydrate the digital twin. And that is a key for us, and that's, that's must. And once the smart agents, they start collecting the data, as Dipain showed, they were collecting interfaces data, process data, memory, whole bunch of data. The, the smart agents, they also update the digital twin with those attributes. So that means when you go to the autopilot, you'll be able to see what those uh, attributes are. And then, the cognitive decisions module, they come into play. So these are the streaming analytics capabilities, batch analytics capabilities, in some cases, advanced A and, A and ML analytics capabilities. They start looking into the data. And in this particular case, in one of the links, as I'm going to show, is having an increased errors in CRC errors. Okay? And the cognitive decision capabilities, they detected the CRC errors, and then they actually flag that particular link saying that there's a CRC error or increased in CRC errors. It could be due to bad cabling, it could be due to you know, twisted cables, it could be old cables, whatnot. And once the cognitive decision, they updated the digital twins attributes, so then they also take the next step, which is actually updating the routing cost of that particular link. They maximize the cost so that that ensures that that link is, not, is no longer going to be used. Now, the routing protocols, the calculation, they start converge, and then the routing table gets updated, and then the traffic gets automatically rerouted around the failures. And once that's done, we are not going to stop right there. We know that it's, going to, it's due to a cabling issue. The cognitive decision, they also create a work order. First, they inform the customer saying that there's a problem. They automatically create a work order saying that, there is a problem in possible problem in this link, and that work order it, it's reflected in the Nile autopilot portal, which is the CMP, which uh, uh, Shiv showed. So once that happens, now the customer knows about it. Now the customer success manager knows about it. Everyone knows about that this is a problem, and also the whole network behavior change without an end user or the IT administrators knowing about it. Absolutely zero interrupt to the network service. Karthik, can I ask you a small question as if I'm a delegate? Can you tell us more about the dynamic threshold? Yes, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Ozer. So the dynamic threshold is, in some cases, we use the AI and ML capabilities to find out what the threshold needs to be. So here's an example, right? So in case of CRC errors or in case of CPU spikes, right, we look at the algorithms, they look at the historical data, and then they learn the patterns. and then they actually predict what the threshold, the, the, the actual threshold should be. And the prediction could be a simple uh, linear regression or in case some advanced cases, some LSTM based models that we employ. So once they predict, they use that threshold to look at the existing or the, the latest data. And then if the latest data doesn't meet the threshold, they just flag it. So that's the dynamic threshold capability. Thanks, Ozer. So here, this is a digital twin of one of our customers. And uh, there, are, there are access switches, distribution switches, access points, and then there are some sensors as well. In this particular case, the link between this switch 65674 uh, and the 65988 had an issue. And uh, it detected that there was a CRC error, 
interface and CRC errors. And that is, that is with this found out in this switch. This is the DS switch. And then it automatically ticket get created. And this is not for the customer. This is only in the autopilot. And it gets created. And then the OSPF cost now is set to maximum between the two. So that way, this link is completely taken out of the equation. Once that's done, once the closed loop is complete, once the customer updated it or the situation got corrected, the OSPF cost set to back to normal, set to default. So that way, the traffic gets back to the normalcy. Okay. And uh, similar to what Dipen showed, there is a, um, yeah, all that data that we collect are shown here. That's made possible with this. Okay. Is there a, a threshold between events, like a, a, like a dampening period, where if something were to happen and it were to change the cost and then it were to, be better again. Yes. It, like it won't thrash back and forth. Yeah. We have a certain time period called soaking time period, okay. which actually waits until to ensure that it actually crosses the particular threshold. Okay. Yeah. Can that link or you know connection that we took out of service, can we trigger an event or something back from when that work order is closed? Say, hey, we did find a problem and we replaced the cable. Yep. Uh, how do we, can we trigger that to go back and, and do another validation and put that back in service? Yep, that's when this happened. It automatically validates. So yeah, the dynamic threshold, it validates before you even set this. So this is one ticket, it tracks everything. Not only increasing the cost, but also going back to the original one. Okay. Yeah. I've got a question about, like, okay, so that CRC error, what if it's determined that, you know, a, a squirrel ate the fiber? Is that a customer responsibility? Or since this is as a service, then y'all design the, I'm, I'm confused as to where, who pays for what and, and all of that. Yeah, so this is part of our uh, joint responsibility model in the case of uh, Squirrel ate the fiber. That's when the work order that we automatically created, created goes back to the customer. And then the customer, we work with the customer to fix the fiber and then the fiber gets uh, you know, once the fiber is fixed, then the topology gets updated. So it's the customer's responsibility to pay for it. I got you. So do you automatically send out the fiber? Like, would you be shipping it, or would it be up to the customer to source the material to get, resolve the issue? It depends on the business model that we follow. In some cases, in most of the cases, is the customer's responsibility for the for the fiber. So it depends on the uh, situation. If the customer has a partner, because many times customers have partners, they have badges, access into the building and all of that. So we work with those partners and the partner knows exactly what, ne what needs to be done. And then they go and fix the issue. Once it's fixed, it shows up in our digital twin saying that it's been fixed and it's taken care. And in some cases, you know, we have our partners, they go and take care of it. And coming back to the question, who pays for it, right? And typically for all the cabling, because, you know, frankly, I was at the University of Maryland uh, talking to CAO. Because if you're not taking care of the envo your environment, there's like a lot of food left over and, you know, and the rats are coming out, we cannot really control that environment and we cannot be paying for those. So there is a shared responsibility to ensure that the customer does have certain responsibility, ensuring that, you know, then the closet and the cabling is well kept. Are those clearly defined in like the contract terms with the customers where like there's like a mutual understanding specifically of like the level of, care and upkeep that's required for them? Yes, you know, all of these are laid out in complete statement of work. We do that MSA with the customer. But more importantly, the, we hear from the customers, hey, can you handle that? Let's be honest, all right? Hey, I don't want to deal with it. As much as I understand I need to take the responsibility, but can you handle that? Mm -hmm. So that's when we have the partners who handle it on behalf of the customer, but working closely with us. Okay. So the partners are coming in really in replacing the fiber. That so there's no, no really need for an on-site person to handle anything. That is right. And then other thing I want to mention is, you know, if you look at our Nile service block, has a built-in redundancy and resilience into that. So the way we've done is, if there is any problem that happens, you know, because of the redundancy, automatically you work around it and you have time to replace that particular one. You don't have to react within the next two hours or three hours to handle that situation. So um, that kind of showed us wired link as well in both the wireless issues and wired issues i'm going to be um, repeating myself a little bit but in both cases the tickets were created automatically that entire table of information that you've seen 
I generated it automatically. The system started monitoring against those tickets. What's the current status? If it continued to see that being an active issue, kept the ticket open. And when the state got back to normal, the quality is good, coverage is good, the wired link is back to normal, it closed itself. And then notify the customer success team, the customer saying, hey, this stick is now closed. All right, so that automation goes back to Shresh's comment on shift left. Those capabilities, those activities used to be manual. We're now shifting left and bringing it back to how the hardware and software is actually orchestrated and managed.